Welcome and aloha. I'm Mark Schlaub, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today, we're going across the sea to Europe to speak with guests from Austria and Belgium, but we're also staying in Hawaii at the same time. My guests are Celia Debont and Armin Meyerhofer. Celia is from Belgium and Armin is from Austria. They are both enrolled in the LLM Master of Laws program at the University of Hawaii's William S. Richardson School of Law. I've asked Celia and Armin to share their personal and knowledgeable European perspectives about current events in Europe, focusing on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Welcome, Celia and Armin. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for coming today and being, being uh, my guests. It's nice to see you both. Uh, before we get into the questions, and I, I really want to get into those, let's take a look at the map of Europe and see where you're each from. Uh, let's, okay, so Celia, uh, Belgium is on the coast there, and uh, it is you know, closer to the United Kingdom than to Ukraine. Uh, and then Austria, Armin, is kind of in the middle of everything. And it, it, it stretches east and west. And depending on where you're living, I guess, geography plays a, a part in perspective. Uh, is that anything you want to add, either of you, to the geographical uh, descriptions? Uh, geographical descriptions are accurate. Um, it might be interesting to mention that if you live in the east of Austria, you're closer to Ukraine than to the west of Austria. And uh, can I assume that may make a difference in your views if, if you live there? It, it sure does, especially the capital of Austria, Vienna, is located in the east. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, I, I want to get right to it. I mean, what I, I, I want to ask you generally, because I want our viewers to gain some knowledge, what are the perspectives within Europe concerning the Russian invasion of Ukraine? And then I'd like you each to talk about your respective home countries, Austria and Belgium. Uh, you know, let, let, let's begin, Celia. Uh, generally, what are the viewpoints that you can share with us from your personal experience and knowledge about Europe and Belgium? Um, yeah, um, Europe is against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, there has been a lot of economic sanctions. I know there talking about maybe even go harder on the sanctions um, and especially for Belgium there was uh, so the president of Ukraine Zelensky he had a speech he talked by uh, zoom and at the end of his speech he had a standing ovation of all the parliament parliamentary so we yeah, were basically siding with Ukraine and and that's the general view in Europe and is it the same in, in Belgium? Is that, is, that what you're, is, that, is that what I can con con conclude? Um, it's the view of Belgium, most of Belgians. Um, I don't think it's um, the, everybody's okay with the economic sanctions of Europe. I, don't, I know Austria, some of them are not <laughs> completely agreeing with, with Europe. Okay. Uh, I think Armin can talk about it a bit more. Uh, Armin, yeah, okay. Now, what what is your views and perspective? Um, I first I agree with Celia on the um, European perspective. Um, the whole European Union seems, on the surface, at least, very united against that war of aggression. Um, the all the um, sanctions were kind of a bit hard to implement. Well, let's say certain of them were hard to implement for Austria because Austria, in addition, um, is a neutral country. 
So we try to stay neutral, but we have to implement certain sanctions. So, okay. Well, well, okay. <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> I mean, what, what, what is happening? How, how does uh, Austria and why, why is it neutral? And, and how does it implement sanctions if it's supposed to be neutral? They're economic sanctions mostly. And why is it neutral? That is buried in, uh, in history, it comes from the Second World War. Right after that, um, Austria said, okay, we, we, don't want, we don't ever want something like that to happen again. So Austria declared something like an eternal neutrality, which is in our constitution. That says that we're not, we, we, can, we can assist countries in certain um, issues, but we're not doing any military aid, as in aggressive military aid. Sometimes we send out peacekeeping forces, but that is more like um, cleaning up after a war, like um, removing of, of landmines and so on. But nothing like we send um, heavy artillery to support the war. And Belgium, do they uh, send material also to support Ukraine at this point? Have they done that or, or not? Uh, no, they haven't, but I know they have sent military to Romania. Uh, but to protect the European um, borders and not to help Ukraine. Okay, so so I'm getting from you both that there is a general um, feeling in Europe that there is a uh, that this Russian invasion is wrong and not supported. Is that correct? First, generally, yeah. both. Yes. yes. Okay, but. Um, there is some reluctance also from both from all, from all throughout Europe and from your own countries. Yes, because um, Ukraine is not part of the NATO, um, so they don't want any military action against Putin because Russia is still a powerful uh, country. I mean, we can see it with the gas prices. <laughs> Um, everything's been up, like, I think, 150%, even more. Um, so we know that if we go to war with Russia, it's going to be a world war. Well, okay, let me, and this may uh, be follow up to Armin's talk about the uh, reluctance uh, to do some uh, restrictions, the gas and oil. I mean, how did uh, how did Europe get involved with gas and oil from Russia? Did, I mean, that, does then didn't that seem like a strategic mistake? And and does, is that one of the reasons that Europe uh, is reluctant to do more? Uh, from what I'm hearing, and, and you got to clear me up if I'm wrong. Uh, Celia, let's start with you. I don't have an answer on, I don't understand why they would, I know that right before the whole thing, they were already, to Belgium was already talking about getting the gas um, and oil from another country, but I honestly do not understand why they took so long to change it, but I don't have an answer for it. I'm sorry, <laughs> I really don't know. But Ar Armin, your thoughts? Um. I, I tried to find uh, to find out a bit more in preparation of of this, and um, so what I found out was that Austria um, actually is is only well Austria gets eighty percent of its oil from somewhere else, so not Russia. But it is what I what I read. It is the the general energy need in the whole European Union is so high that 
a complete um, gas and oil embargo. And they, when we would say like, let's stop importing anything from Russia, that would not be possible. Because then we, I think we get about 10% um, gas from uh, Russia. And there are some countries that get about 20 and sometimes even to 40% of their whole energy demand via Russian energy. So we, there's a economical problem with sanctions uh, for Europe. That's the realistic viewpoint. That's what I hear you saying. Yes. Uh, are there any other repercussions uh, besides the oil and gas? Any, anything specifically for Europe or your countries, uh, Armin? I, I try to think about that. Um, I mean, the oil and gas is kind of a major, a major economic factor. So that is that is a given. But the other um, the other sanctions or the other repercussions we have is certain. We're not allowed to deal anymore with certain um, companies in Russia, or some companies even said we don't wait for a sanction like that, we simply cut ties with all Russian um, clients or customers. We, we simply are not cooperating anymore with Russian companies or even with companies that are mainly in Russian hands. Okay, so there, there are private companies taking action, not with government uh, approval or anything, just doing it because they feel it's the right thing to do is what I hear you saying. Celia, what, what's, what, what's your views? Um, so we import a lot from Russia um, and I looked it up. I saw on a site that they uh, blocked <laughs> thousands of luxury cars from Russia. They seized it in a port, um, but it's mostly in line with the European section. sanctions. For example, we uh, just read here, blocked 196 billions in Russian financial transactions. Okay, and is that uh, private companies doing that, uh, basically, or government? Government. Okay, now, um, is there a consensus in Europe about why this is happening? I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, haven't we had enough problems in the world? Why do we have to have this? Is there is there a thought about why this invasion uh, began, uh, Celia? Is there a is there a European consensus about that, or within Belgium, what, is there thoughts about it? What where what is that perspective? Um, in Belgium, they say it's a war of Putin and not of the Russian uh, people because um, we believe that he's, he wants to reunite the previous countries of the USSR. Okay. And he used, uh, the, he says that there is a, a genocide of Russian people in two parts of uh, Ukraine and that's how he started it, how he justified the invasion. And that's why we think he started the war. So the Belgian view is that he's, he's trying to reunite uh, the Soviet Union uh, yeah. country. I see. Yeah. Armin? How powerful. Yeah. Armin, we're same, different? Not, 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 not at all. Not at all. We, we see it kind of similar, but because our proximity to um, that whole eastern part, if he would, if in case Ukraine would be part of, of Russia again, what stops, what, what would stop Putin to do the same thing with other former USSR countries? He already did it with Georgia. 
Exactly. And so, okay, so, and, and I, I hear a distinction between Putin and, and the Russian people, although uh, there has been a lot of criticism about the Russian people per se, I, which I've, I've seen, but I mean, do Europeans think that it, this is Putin's war? essentially, or is there still relations with the Russian people? How, how is that, uh, Armin? How is that going with, within Europe and Russia? What, what is the viewpoint uh, towards who, you know, who's responsible? And is there a, a bad feeling about the Russian people? So from, from what I was reading, there is, there is a lot of, let's say, articles that point towards um, that it's a war of Putin. So he's, he's in control of this. It's not per se the Russian people. There are, from what I read, there are lots of, of Russian people actually against the war. Some of them are, are at least they try to demonstrate. Um, they get... <laughs> They get usually very, very quickly off the off the streets and in front of, of criminal judges. And yeah, so at least that's what I could could read about that. Delia, you know, uh, there's been uh, it, so there's there's sort of a distinction, is that right, between Putin and the Russian people? Uh, there there is there animosity towards Russia in I mean the people uh, as opposed to Putin in Belgium, or is there a distinction? Um, some people think that the Russian population should be go against Putin. Some people understand that they are, I'm trying to find a good, better word for brainwashed, like with the propaganda. So it's, I mean, like Armin says, you can demonstrate you're going to jail as soon as you're, I mean, that's why we read about it. As soon as you are against what Putin thinks and says, um, you you don't have any rights. Um, so I think some people are making a distinction. Like they might think that they're in the right to invade Ukraine, but at the same time, is it because they really think it or because they only hear the Russian side of it. So I hear you both saying that the, the European viewpoint is that there is a distinction between the people who may be innocent, but brainwashed to, yeah. to use that term, and, and Putin who is just has his own goals in this. Is that correct? Is that More or less, yeah. I think that's a good summary, summary of how we think about it. Okay. Uh, uh, Celia, you, you also mentioned that a NATO kind of plays a role here. And there's been some news that maybe Finland and Sweden would join NATO. Uh, and, and there's also been some talk that NATO caused this problem because it, it uh, is uh, um, a threat to, to Russia somehow. Any thoughts on, on I mean, and, and Belgium is, is the host country for NATO, right? I mean, that's the, where the headquarters are. Uh, well, what, are what are your thoughts about NATO's involvement in those questions? Um, he's probably, um, NATO is probably a threat to Russia, but I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's NATO's fault <laughs> that Russia invaded Ukraine. That's my opinion. Do you think uh, Finland and Sweden are going to join NATO? Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I hope so. So we're more um, countries, but I'm not sure. Armin, uh, your thoughts. Uh, and, and also, I mean, what... I know that you said that Austria is neutral for historical reasons. I mean, would, would, has anybody talked in Austria about joining NATO? But f first of all, f Finland and uh, uh, Sweden, what are your thoughts? I think, I think they, they will at least try to, to join 
NATO, they would benefit, in my opinion, from it. They, I mean, Sweden and Finland, they are, let's say, also very close. And if I'm, if memory serves me, um, Finland had an issue, and Sweden, I think, with Russian mix violating their airspace in the past more and more. Um, that could lead to, again, something very bad. If they join, even, that could lead to something really bad. Um, but I know what you, what you meant before, that talk that uh, NATO, that NATO might have caused it because Ukraine wanted to join NATO and Putin felt threatened. I read these arguments too. Um, but on the other, on the other side, um, Ukraine wants to join the European Union now too. So it's a bit, it's a bit hard to to see through all of that. Yeah, and that's still yeah. to come. Those are, and to feel, and it's uncertain how it'll work. It's sort of a, a chess game in a way, is, uh, is what I'm hearing. I mean, it, 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 people are still waiting to see what's going to happen, and they're not sure what the reaction will be, and there's some caution. Yeah, I think it's more like a three dimensional chess game, not just a plain two dimensional. It's more like a three dimensional chess game, which is way more complex than a traditional one. Um, and on your other question about Austria and NATO views, um, there have been, I mean, since I can, since, since I can remember, there has been um, talk about shouldn't we, shouldn't we join NATO? Shouldn't we abandon neutrality? Um, but I think since it would involve a constitutional amendment, this would be really hard in the current political environment to push through. So I don't think that in the near future, something like that is going to happen. Okay. Well, you, you mentioned, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, get back to this and talk some more about Austria specifically. I mean, you, you, you say they want to maintain neutrality, but there is some talk about uh, NATO, but would Austria build up its own military at this point? Is that, is that being considered or is, is it taking steps in that, one, in that regard? one big part of being neutral is being able to defend yourself if you're being attacked. So Austria has its um, military. Um, so we have a military and um, unless you don't want to um, pick up a gun, you have to um, do a, a military service mandatory military service it's quite short um but you have to do that um, and, and you, you you undertook that yeah i i did that um in 2003 so a while ago already um and i mean it's mostly it's mostly seen as it is kind of a civil service what the military does it's here for um, when something really bad happens, like um, floodings and so on, to rebuild bridges, to make certain um, towns accessible again, but also to enforce um, water protection. Okay. Now less than maybe um, before, I think, 2008, because then we expanded the Schengen room. Um, yeah. Celia, let, let me ask you, you know, um, you, you have some 
you know, you're, you, one, one, one of your hobbies is tennis, okay? <laughs> and uh, I, I know. And, and has there been any reaction about your, your friends in, in, in Russia who play tennis? And is there any, have you, do you, do you, have you heard anything about that is, uh, to this event? I don't have any Russian friends who play uh, tennis, but I know that um, UK is not part of Europe anymore, but we have the Wimbledon. Uh, there's a Wimbledon tournament and they banned all Russian and Belarusian uh, players. And there are some rumors about maybe Paris with the other big tournament to ban uh, Russian and Belarusian um, players too. And, and that would be... a. A, a general European viewpoint that that's a proper? Uh, no, because um, France is not completely agreeing with what Wimbledon did. So that's the whole point of like, should they do it? Some people think they should, some other. Again, there is a distinction between Putin and uh, the Russian population because there is one important player, uh, Rublev, who is openly against the war. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's uh, just, it depends on who decides what's going to happen. And I think every country um, in that sense is different. Okay, so that's interesting. That's a point I, I don't think I've heard before. Um, now, we, we have a few minutes left. Um, I, I just want to ask you both, is there any European leader uh, who inspires trust, confidence, and hope within Europe, within the people of Europe at this time? Is there anybody in particular that you could talk about? Uh, Celia? There's no one in particular, but with the um, French um, elections just being done, and so you have Macron who won, um, I'm happy and I think most Belgian people are happy about that because Le Pen has had close relationships with Putin so we wouldn't know how that would end up. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say I'm not 100% behind Macron for everything he thinks and does but it's better than Le Pen. Okay and would that be a general viewpoint if you think in Europe and in Belgium? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That's your view viewpoint. Uh, yeah. Okay. Ar Ar Armin, please, what are your thoughts in that regard with respect to somebody, a leader in, the, in Europe? I was, I was trying to think about that very hard, but honestly, I don't see, I don't see any, any leader that, that stands out in the whole, in the whole European Union, at least the ones that I that I follow, they're quite, let's say, the opposite. There are a few ones that might be dangerous. Um, even, I think a few days, a few days ago, maybe a couple of weeks, there was um, the Ukrainian ambassador in Hungary said they should stop undermining. European unity because their leader is more on the um, on the pen side, let's call it that, like Celia said before. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what I meant in the beginning when I said that it seems that on the surface there is unity, but if you go a bit deeper, there are certain um, Conflicts, let's call it like that. Ah, okay. So it's a deeper, deeper conversation. There, there's different perspectives. And guess what? The United States is similar, I would think, uh, to some of that. Um, now, in 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 the the minute we have left, uh, do you have any other closing thoughts that you'd like to share about Europe, the perspectives that you have, Armin? Uh, what, what, what would you like to convey to people in Hawaii and, and, and the world and the United States in particular about Europe and what it's going through now? Um, 
I think I think Europe has has a different, a complete different um, view on that armed conflict than the U.S. We're living right next to that conflict. The U.S. is far away, at least at least an ocean away. Every <laughs> on every side you look at it, so it's happening right next door, and. The people that are affected there, they look like our neighbors. They could live right next to you. So there is some certain um, people can relate to them better. And maybe that's something to take into account when thinking about that. So there is concern by proximity, by geography, and hey, uh, America, you're you're a long way away from the bombs. Celia, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, I wanted to follow up on what Armin said. Um, even if I'm further away from Ukraine, it's still only three hours play from uh, each other, um, and we're gonna be the first one affected if there is if the war even goes beyond the borders Ukraine Russia. So like Armin said, we we feel with Ukraine, we like we see um, videos how it was so pretty at first, and then now it's just completely bombarded. There's no buildings left. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be the first one affected, and it's it's really scary to have something that's happening almost right next door for me and for Armin even closer to home. Okay, well, I want to thank you both for sharing your thoughts. And, and I, I see, you know, that um, the, the, the proximity to the problem is, causes mixed feelings within Europe and uh, also uh, concerns for what the future holds. And, and, and none of us know uh, where this is going. Uh, but I, I'm glad to share your, that you've shared your, your perspective. So thank you. Uh, Celia and Armin, very much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad you're here in Hawaii and are able to, to talk with us about uh, what's happening in Europe. So mahalo, aloha, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.